Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the event coordinator at the bookstore, and Community will be celebrating 50 years in business this fall. We credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. Thank you for spending the evening with us. I'm thrilled today to be partnering once again with our friends at Two Lines Press and the Center for the Art of Translation to welcome Isabel Fargo Cole for a discussion of her new translation of Wolfgang Hildich's The Interim in conversation with Rachel Kushner. Now to some housekeeping, uh, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, hit the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button also at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. Um, there's also a chat box to which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So if you have any, uh, if we have any technical issues, please bear with us and we'll resolve them quickly. Uh, we still have a number of very exciting events for you in 2021. So do head over to our website, communitybookstore.net to stay up to date, um, sign up for our newsletter. Two that I wanna point out in particular, Tomorrow, we're thrilled to welcome Adam Soto and Okazi Nwoka for their new books, This Weightless World and God of Mercy, in conversation with, edit with editor um, Daniel Vasquez. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. And on Tuesday, December 30th, we'll have Lydia Davis discussing her new nonfiction collection, Essays 2 on Proust's Translation, Foreign Languages, and the City of Arles, in conversation with Parle Segal. Tickets include a copy of the book and are available on our website as well. So now a, a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Isabel Fargo Cole is a US born Berlin based writer and translator. Her translations include five books of Wolfgang Hilbig, including Old Rendering Plant for which she received the Helen and Kurt Wolf Translators Prize. She has also been the recipient of a prestigious Penn Haim translation grant and her novel Die Grüne Grenze was a finalist for the 2018 Preis der Leipziger Buchmesse. My apologies for my German. <laughs> uh, Rachel Kushner is the author of the internationally acclaimed novels The Mars Room, The Flamethrowers, and Telex from Cuba, as well as a book of short stories, The Strange Case of Rachel Kay. Her new book, The Hard Crowd, Essays 2000 to 2020, was published in April 2021. She has won the Prix Medici and has been a finalist for the Booker Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Folio Prize, the James Tate Black Prize, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, and was twice a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction. She's a Guggenheim Foundation Fellow and the recipient of the Harold D. Versell Memorial Award for the Academy of Arts and Letters, sorry, from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her books have been translated into 26 languages. So now without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you. Isabel, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Noah. Um, hi, Isabel. Um, hey. It's strange, the community bookstore screen is pinned on my screen, so I'm just staring at this text. I wonder if I can change it so that it's speaker view. Um, are you having that problem? Yeah, it's pinned with me too. Oh, there we go. Um, it's just in a realm of dematerialized existences, we can at least yeah. have the simulacrum of facing each other through yeah. the void. Um, so um, you have translated all of the work of Wolfgang Hilbig that exists in English. And um, I just want to start by saying that uh, when I was approached to do this, I'm a bit ashamed to confess that I didn't know anything about uh, Wolfgang Hilbig. Mm -hmm. And when I started looking into his work and also seeing that, I will mispronounce, but the Hungarian writer Lasno Krasnokorkai, is that how I say it? Don't ask me. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, everybody knows who I mean. The author of Satan Tango um, had given him this blurb, Wolfgang Hilbig is an artist of immense stature. I thought, well, I, I want to read this book. Uh, and it was sent to me and I started poking around in it and was just immediately engrossed. Um, I had read something somewhere along the way that compared Hilbig to uh, Sebald. And I find that um, just for my own, I, I like Sebald quite a lot, but for my own taste and sensibilities, it's a completely different animal because it's so licentious 
and whirling uh, and very comic um, and just so much more openly bleak. It doesn't have that kind of um, repressed, glassy sense of myth making that's covering over something that will never be spoken of. It kind of seems like everything is spoken of. Yeah, rather. it's all wallowed in, yeah. Say that again? It, he wallows in it. Yeah, he does wallow in it. So um, so this is the new book, The Interim, and now I, I want to read all of them. But I thought we could start, if there are people logging on, maybe there are people logging on who know a great deal about Hilbig and have read the other four publications that you translated, which from what I understand are more no novellas than novels, but maybe some people haven't read them. So just for my own fun and self-indulgence as well, um, I wanted to just read like, some very short excerpts that I flagged that I like a lot. And each one of them kind of seems to um, do a bit of labor to summarize his feelings about a particular subject. And the subjects in this book, they they move pretty fast, even if he does sort of, you know, circle around things and return to them and, as you say, wallow. But I, I made a quick list when I was reading um, very early in the book he goes to a rehab facility, which is like, you know, nurse ratchet times 100. It's very one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And then there are a lot of things about trains, author readings, hotels, alcoholism, television pay-per-view, alcoholism, women, bookstores, lovers, cafes, peep shows, churches, churches and whorehouses, loneliness, factory work, um, he was a stoker and a boring mill operator, writers, their photographs, um, and then finally, maybe one could say God becomes the subject. So I thought I would just read a few little. So here is Wolfgang Hilbig on self-abolition. He couldn't abolish the wall, meaning obviously the Berlin Wall, he wanted to change the state he was in. Oh, excuse me. If he wanted to change the state he was in, all he could do was abolish himself. And I should say this isn't Hilbig per se, but his um, alter ego in the form of a narrator who he names only the letter C. I mean, I'm assuming it's an alter ego, but um, C on his buttery leather jacket that um, has been gifted to him, as I understand it, by a woman from the West. Can't you take that jacket off for once? Asked Mona. Mona, as I understand it, is his woman in the East. Or do you want to go to bed with it? Mona had recently gone into an analysis, developing a keen eye for unconsciously symbolic actions. You're already wearing your Western skin, she said. Hilbig or his alter ego on <clears throat> insufficient clothing is offered in the German Democratic Republic. His genitals were constantly in the way of the cut of the underpants, which, unable to make the organ disappear, bundled it up to a form of a damp, amorphous lump of whose existence he was continually conscious. Clearly, he no longer fit into the GDR's latest underwear creations, though his body had not changed a bit. The narrator on weather, of which there are fabulous descriptions all throughout this book, I mean, really, like, you would think that it's all been done, but it hasn't. It was constantly raining ten times a day with the sun always breaking through again. The street would still be a glitter with moisture and the sun would blaze down onto the dripping and trickling. Mud washed down the street and collected in the craters of the crumbling roadway. Nettles shot up from the omnipresent rubble heaps. You could watch how greedily they sprouted in the humidity, scaldy July days. Uh, Wolfgang Hilbig or his alter ego on doing author readings. All he knew was this. These reading tours were being orchestrated in order to destroy and unmask him. And that seemed to be the very reason he agreed to appear. Wolfgang on the porn industry.
What had lured him to the West was the porn industry. At any rate, it had, play, it had played a major role in what certain benevolently pontificating culture writers described as C's emigration. The artistic freedom he strove for, so he told himself, actually consisted of sitting in a West German hotel room and watching pay-per-view television. Uh, on workers and writers. Workers, just like writers, were obsolete economic models. At least they had that in common. For ages, he'd bemoaned the fact that he was forced to live two different models of life, that of a worker and that of a writer, and neither of them properly. Now, both were shot to hell. And I should say by worker, I'm assuming he really means factory worker, somebody who does manual yeah. labor and uses their body and their work. Um, on love as an interim. He'd never had the potency, so he believed, to work his way through decades bunkered down in a marriage. If he heard the word duty, he broke out in a cold sweat. His stomach turned when he saw a double bed somewhere. He was a guy for doorways, park benches, and pissoir nooks. Once his desire had been slaked, he lost interest. Hilbegor's alter ego on having your photograph taken. The only way to show him was a figure on the run with the camera firing away at his back. On having been born a writer and not necessarily having chosen that path. Until he was pulverized by this orbit of idiocy, he kept traveling, circling a god who refused him his love, who refused it because he'd chosen C to write. So thanks for enduring that. Oh, thank you so much for that wonderful reading. Um, your translation is, I believe is phenomenal. I do not uh, read German and didn't compare translations side by side, obviously incapable of doing that. But I believe actually that most people who would, even if they know German, um, to know whether a translation is good or not on that level requires a deep idiomatic familiarity with the foreign language that you're comparing it to. But I do know translations from having studied translation with the great translator Richard Howard and having worked as an editor at a magazine called Grand Street that was primarily mm -hmm. literature published in translations. And when you do a lot of that, you become very adept at flagging places where the translator has uh, made a literal translation of something that needs an idiomatic transposition, you know, or where there's something knotted that they haven't been able to unknot. And I must say that reading this book, I never had a single moment of that. It is just so smoothly and beautifully translated. And it has, I think, what Richard Howard used to call the burnish of eternity to it. Like, it doesn't feel like somebody's <laughs> going to have to go back and unknot something that you did and retranslate it. It really um, sings on its own in English. So um, you must also be a writer yourself, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, well, there are a lot of knots. I mean, there are actually a lot of knots in the writing that, uh, yeah but I try to keep them as knotted as they are originally. <laughs> yeah, so like, tell me about your relationship to Hilbig. How did you come to his work and when did you decide that you wanted to, I mean, translating somebody is a long and intimate and lonely ride, is it not? Yeah, it was certainly a long ride. Um, I, I, I first encountered him, I, I came to Berlin uh, for good in 95 and in 1995 and um, kind of immerse myself um, in basically East German circles and was just kind of trying to just explore this whole kind of vanished or, you know, just recently vanished uh, East German world. And uh, one friend of mine who was an avid book collector introduced me to Hilbisch and, and read him aloud to me some of his uh, very short, he wrote all, also very, very short pieces, short prose pieces that are almost like prose poems. And just that language really kind of grabbed me. And there was something about 
there was something about the way he wrote, although these were very surreal pieces um, with this kind of Gothic atmosphere, they're so sensual in this very gritty way that they really made me, it was like for the first time I felt like I could really kind of sense this reality of East Germany, even though it was, I mean, through this surrealism, uh, I was able to kind of get the sense of immediacy about that, that world. Um, so I just kept on reading him. And at some point I was, you know, I was starting to get into, you know, to want to explore translation and learned that he hadn't been, uh, that his German publisher hadn't been able to, hadn't been able to find an, an English language publisher for his works, which I, I thought was really incredible considering how important he is in Germany. And so I started trying myself, but it took literally a decade to uh, find a publisher um, for his work. And the, the first publisher is Seagull Books in, in Calcutta, which did his, uh, Stasi novel, I, and then uh, Two Lines has been doing the rest. So it, um, yeah, it was interesting. It was for a long time, I would kind of hear from publishers that, oh, you know, East Germany, uh, yeah, no one's, no one's interested in East Germany. That's all just kind of dusty and irrelevant. And, uh, and then this, this Stasi novel, I came out in 2013, which was in the midst of the Snowden revelations in the midst of, uh, a big discussion about surveillance. And I think suddenly there was this realization that, you know, a lot of things that, uh, you know, we, we thought were just kind of relegated to the past, like living in a surveillance society were actually, unfortunately, still very relevant today. And he has a perspective on these, on the psychology of these things that, um, that you can really, uh, it really has a lot to say to us now. Right. Um, I feel like that reminds me that while reading this book, I, I felt that it somehow skirted around doing anything like, I don't know, so vulgar as making ideological arguments. Like, it doesn't remind me of watching um, that movie, The Lives of Others, for instance. No, which was made by a West German, I should, I should mention. Okay, well, that somehow comes as no surprise. Um, and, and I know that it, like, it's a cliche to bring that up, and it just shows you how little I know of the German Democratic Republic. Yeah. I mean, but I have to say that that movie did, I think, that, that movie was very helpful, I think, in, in making people aware of East Germany as a subject for literature. So I think that movie really helped to... Um, you know, prepare people for, for Hillbish in a way. Oh yeah, that's interesting. And, and maybe in a way, what I notice as being absent in the book, I notice because it's in so present in some other kind of um, cultural, <laughs> not products, but you know, like that film for instance, or like the way that the GDR figures in culture generally, but in the book, it seems like he's not really focusing on an argument about having, um, for instance, a sort of state obliterated sense of Western individuality, which I feel like you sometimes find in writings about the GDR. And he's, it's more a kind of apt aftermath of having, correct me, he, he was born in 41, which seems really key because he is not, a, in, of himself, he is not originally a product of the GDR, um, but then his sort of existential state in the book is that he has become so. Like, he's, at one point, he, in a moment, he points out that uh, the GDR represses the word German in it, Germany, so that you just say GDR. And he, he has this other line where he talks about um, his girlfriend who's Eastern European has this kind of like latent um, religion, Catholicism in her. And for he talks about um, something that can grow after it's been cut off at the roots. And I was thinking that in a way like his original national identity is also cut off at the roots. And then there's the GDR and then in the book, the GDR is about to become undone completely. And he's sort of in the aftermath of both places. No, I mean, it's like the divisions are 
inside him very deeply and he's more preoccupied with that than he is with um, the ideas and interpenetration of the Stasi and as you were mentioning, this kind of surveillance culture and its effects on people. Yeah. Well, I think this book, uh, The Interim, is unusual in his works in that it's really, you know, it moves between East and West. And most of his books really are set in the East and they do focus more directly with uh, issues of, um, of the dictatorship in the East. And he also, in, in, in essays, he would, you know, he spoke about that more uh, explicitly, um, but he was very, uh, careful about ideological statements, um, and and he really had no. He didn't go to the West because uh, he just kind of ended up there. I mean, like the character in the book, he just had a you know it is very it is a very autobiographical book. It was you know in the the mid eighties he got a you know a fellowship to spend a year. Uh, in West Germany and the East German authorities gave him a visa and he was able to actually even travel back and forth for that year. And then he just kind of, um, I, I think partly because he met his then, uh, the woman who became his wife, who's also a very prominent author, by the way, Natasha Vodin, uh, he just stayed there. But it wasn't that he wanted this freedom. I mean, he wanted, he published in West Germany while writing in East Germany. He wasn't able to publish in East Germany, so he published in the West. And of course, he appreciated that he could, um, you know, express himself there. But he was very, very, um, you know, obviously very alienated by this this consumer society. And I think I would go back and correct. I, I would actually describe him as a product of East Germany because he lived, uh, you know, his his childhood years were spent during the war, and and he was very, his father was missing in action at Stalingrad. And so that was very, uh, very, very present for him. Uh, so he is, I think, very much shaped by the GDR, but also by this war experience. And I think one thing that comes across in the interim is that kind of the fundamental thing is this, you know, the substrate of the war and there's, you know, Auschwitz uh, on the other hand, well, I mean, he's, he's kind of very symbolically, he's carting around these crates of books that are literally marked Auschwitz and Gulag. So he's kind of stuck between, you know, the crimes of the right and left in a way. And it's, you know, that's one reason why it's very hard for him to uh, have many illusions about any given political system. So I think that in many ways, he's more concerned with these, um, you know, the, this, these common, this kind of darkness in the past of Germany. And I think one reason maybe that he feels less at home in the West is that you have this kind of shiny surface, uh, you know, above, I mean, obviously West Germans, you know, they, they did deal with their past, you know, probably in many ways more thoroughly than East Germans. But um, I, I have this sense that for him, he kind of felt more in a sense, uh, put off by this kind of glossy surface in the West because it's in such a contrast to, uh, you know, the, the crimes that happened just a couple of decades before. Right. Yeah, I mean, the well, the book opens with what seems to be this very serious moment of a guy uh, who's going to, in a beleaguered mindset, disoriented in a Western boutique and somebody comes up behind him and um, attacks him and he turns around and punches the person and it turns out that it's a shop mannequin, correct? And he he never really breaks tone from it. He says, um, he shook his head and looked around nervously, swallowing something that resembled a strange sense of guilt, no doubt about it his counterattack had been much too fierce. <laughs> so like that tone, right? And then later talking about, uh, you know, the the peep shows um, and the pay-per-view and this being like what the West actually has to offer and he's drawn to it and to deeply ambivalent and repulsed by his own need to write, to have these kind of fundamentally empty experiences. Um, 
in terms of the war, there's also a section where he talks about his uh, girlfriend in the West, Hedda, who I assuming is based on the woman that he was married to, who you yeah. said is also quite prominent writer, who from what I understand wrote a book about their marriage. Yeah, she basically in the sense wrote this book from her perspective and it's also a very impressive book. Um, yeah, well, a few things I want to say, I'd be very curious to read that, but the part where he describes her own childhood and being in like a refugee camp um, after in 1945, is like one of the better things I've read about the war when he says, um, in the pathological lack of imagination, the West Germans couldn't conceive that it was utterly irrelevant what group you joined after weeks of blundering through minus 30 degree nights, no roof over your head, and shapes lurking behind every bush. It was irrelevant whom you went along with, Germans or Russians or partisans, for the sheer prospect of a piece of bread. And I've heard that from people whose families are from the East, you know, and had like one day to decide whether to go with the Germans or the Russians. And it's just very beautifully put here. Um, all of that said, I would not want to be married to somebody like the narrator of this book. No, I, I don't think it was e an easy relationship, shall we say. <laughs> an incredible pain in the ass um and he's a terrible alcoholic i mean and just this the way that he describes his relationship to drinking and to his body and this inter there's so many different interims in the book that are so interesting and i'm assuming that when he uses the word interim in german it's quite precise and then you're replicating it also in english well, it's, um, it's something I really struggled with a lot. I mean, the German word is provisorium. So it's like, it means basically kind of a provisional state in a way or a provisional thing. And I was kind of, I, I kind of felt like, okay, it had to be one word in English, like yeah. to convey that sense of the title. And it had to be something that you could kind of be in. So then I came up with the interim and it has kind of a similar sound to it too with the with the m's and but it's it has a slightly different um it has a more temporal aspect than, than the provisorium and the provisorium is more like a kind of a temp like a provisional arrangement or something like that right right so there, there is a slight shift there but there is an interesting i i had to think of uh, there's kind of there's a saying in german that they say uh a provisorium so a provisional arrangement is what always lasts the longest. So like the thing that you think is a stopgap or is just, uh, I mean, that would be another translation. Uh, you know, the thing you think was just a makeshift uh, contrivance ends up, you know, you end up using it for 20 years or something. So I kind of sometimes wonder if he had that in the back of his mind when he when he picked that title. Oh, I, that sounds absolutely perfect to me. I was just thinking of, um, I won't, I don't remember the quote verbatim, but in um, William Gaddis's first novel, The Recognitions, he says something to the effect of um, decision is indecision crystallized, which <laughs> seems very similar. I think that, yeah. Mm. And like, and, and, and I'm always thinking that, that right, that if you can, if you can delay committing to one or the other, um, then you've got a stable state of affairs. Right, and he's shuttling back and forth between these women, one in the West and one in the East, between his identities in the West and his identity in the East, um, but also between waking and sleep. And it seems like alcoholism and drinking is um, a way to create a provisional state that doesn't have to commit to one or the other. And then finally, I was thinking like li like life and death. I mean, I'm sorry to be so sort of melodramatic, but the the interim after birth and preceding death is also another kind of interim. And yeah, like and I think that would absolutely he would absolutely. Um, I, I think he would absolutely see it in that sense too. I mean, he was always. I mean, the book is a lot of it is about death. Uh, and it's something, and he keep he keeps circling uh, in all of his writing. He kind of uh, he he'll keep circling around these these questions and kind of going back to 
you know, he's always kind of, he, he always goes back to his mother, to his childhood room where he was born, where he was literally born, the bed, he, he goes home to his mother and sleeps in the bed that he was born and probably, uh, you know, conceived in. Right. And uh, it, there's, there was a lot of kind of death and life and birth getting folded together and and there's always there's always a very nonlinear quality to his writing. I mean, he has these narrators who, you know, they're kind of in these constant loops and and they're they're sort of progressing, but then suddenly, you know, it's also very hard and it was a problem with translation to figure out the time frames sometimes. And that's I think very much uh, you know, intentional. It's it's very much part of what the book is is doing to have these constant kind of time slips, which, you know, make with the alcoholism that kind of you know makes it plausible that he uh he keeps kind of going back and forth with this you know travel visa that he has where he can go back and forth between east and west and he's just you know he has this one scene where he's not sure if he's what direction he's heading in in the train and uh you know if he's crossed the border in one way or the other or if he hasn't crossed it yet or or you know who which which of his girlfriends he's going to see and it's just all in this kind of uh post alcoholic haze of uh but it's 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 an image or kind of a mode of, of perception that uh i think says something about the broader the broader situation and also i think you know about the, the time that he was writing in which was you know which a lot of people experience as a very stagnant time where it was uh you know no one imagined that the wall would fall it was I mean, not even the most insider politicians, they thought it would just go on and on forever. And I think he's kind of reflecting that state of mind in many ways. Right. So when you say stagnant, I'm, I'm, so you mean like also a kind of cultural stagnation um, among artists trying to be writers in the GDR or? Well, I think in both Germany's, I mean, I think in, in the GDR, there was definitely a lot of frustration. Um, you know, there were niches that, I mean, that there were some really excellent writers that came out of the GDR or working kind of, you know, in, in the niches that they could carve out for themselves. Um, so there was a lot of ferment kind of in an under, underground scene, uh, but there was also just this sense of not really you know, knowing where things were going and uh, obviously a lot of political stagnation. And in West Germany, I think things, you know, obviously it was a much more prosperous country and people could write whatever they wanted. But I think there was also generally in the 80s, a sense that this Cold War was just going to go on and on and on and on until finally, you know, this little guy called Gorbachev, uh, you know, came onto the stage and things started to happen. Uh, but like, I'm um, not to veer too far from Holbeck, but like, what about Krista Wolf? I read that she sort of took an anti-unification position. Is that? Actually a lot, uh, most East German intellectuals didn't want unification because uh, they're, you know, the, the movement within East Germany uh, that ended up bringing about the fall of the wall or, you know, initially you know, marching and asking for more freedoms and civil rights and so forth. The people who were heading that movement, the intellectuals, they were all, they all saw themselves as socialists. They wanted, but they wanted a better socialism. Yeah. So, you know, they kind of had their peaceful revolution and the wall kind of opened up through kind of a weird coincidence, uh, just kind of a chance. Uh, and then, you know, it was kind of, there was this momentum and then West Germany basically ended up kind of, uh, you know, it, it had its system that was working. So, uh, you know, we, the East Germans in the next election that came up basically ended up, you know, voting for, for unification, but those, the actual impetus of that movement within East Germany kind of just fizzled out. It wasn't what people had, it wasn't what those people had wanted who were the, or the, the activists had wanted and I think in retrospect, it is unfortunate that all that, all those energies just kind of, you know, it all got kind of steamrollered by the West that came in. Yeah. And a lot of East German intellectuals were very, 
uh, were very, very frustrated about that because they didn't, they didn't want capitalism. They didn't want, uh, you know, to be run roughshod over by their, you know, by their neighbor, even if their neighbor was bringing them bananas and other nice things. Uh, so, you know, to this day, it's still a very kind of contentious issue. I could imagine. What was his relationship like with other writers? Was he, you know, like sort of, I mean, was he, was he famous? He was famous in his own lifetime, I assume, in Germany? He was probably more of a writer's writer, I'd say. I mean, he was definitely very well known in, uh, in literary circles and very well respected in both East and West Germany. But obviously he's not someone who's going to write this, you know, that, you know, he's not, he doesn't write, you know, the kind of accessible novels that, you know, a mass audience is going to read. So he wasn't, you know, that kind of a famous writer, like he wasn't like Gunter Kross or someone, but um, he was very respected and, you know, he would, you know, people would ask his opinion on things and so forth. Um, Who would you say, does he, are there obvious literary models that you would point to as his kind of aesthetic or tonal forebears? I mean, he was really, um, I mean, he was really very much a self-educated uh, writer. I mean, he came from this very working class background and basically as a kid went to the village library and read Edgar Allan Poe and kind of, you know, Western schlock, uh, whatever, you know, schlock novels and, uh, Hey, Edgar Allan Poe. Literature, great. romantics. I'm sorry? I said Edgar Allan Poe is pretty great. <laughs> yeah. So that was a big influence and in the German romantic writers. Uh, so this whole kind of Gothic tradition. And then, you know, he discovered Kafka and, and you know, a lot of, uh, yeah, that kind of, that kind of writing. So that was, I, I think he was coming more from this, this older tradition, this romantic tradition in a way that was, you know, problematic in the GDR because, you know, the official, officially uh, sanctioned literature was supposed to be very rational and about, you know, positive and, um, <laughs> and so in, in a way he was kind of the ideal, uh, the GDR, they wanted to have, uh, they had this kind of uh, the ideal of the worker writers. So, you know, the writers were supposed to come out of the working class and write about you know, uh, factories and stuff. And he was like the perfect example of that in many ways, because he was a stoker. I mean, he was a real factory worker and yeah. he would sit in the, you know, stoking the boiler and in between shoveling coal, he would sit down at his little table and, and write. And he liked stoking because he would have some peace and quiet for his writing in between shoveling coal, but he wasn't writing the kind of description of factories that they could really do anything with. So um, he just didn't fit into any mold and in the GDR. Right. That's so fast. In the West, for that matter. I mean, the stuff about factory work is quite amazing. And you know for certain that this person really was um, a furnace stoker and then worked on some kind of, um, as a machinist, on some kind of, I don't know if it's an assembly line when he works as a, uh, does, he does milling. Mm. Um, but those parts, you know, yeah, I, when I was reading them, I didn't know enough about the GDR to understand whether he would have had, even within that system, a particular class background, because you mentioned he was working class, and I thought, because when I was reading the book, I almost thought, is it m more like um, the 1970s in Cuba, where you know, people were sort of assigned jobs and you could have intellectual interests and they were separate from your work, but you weren't necessarily born into a destiny of either becoming a doctor or a lawyer or becoming a factory worker. I don't know about the GDR or if it's kind of more Maoist in the way that people are sent into factories because it's, you know, good for their character and the nation. Well, they had that too. I mean, they had, um, a thing where writers or artists would go into the factories and they would be expected to, you know, work some shifts and maybe do kind of workshops with the, the workers and stuff, which I actually think is kind of a cool idea in some ways. But he was really, he was really a working class writer. I mean, he really came from this coal mining town where there, that was, you know, all there was to do basically. Um, and he was the genuine 
article. And it's kind of interesting when he writes about that experience that when he, when he, he's, you know, he's this worker in the factory, but once he starts to write and publish, he separates himself from the, from the working class and feels that he's betrayed them because he's kind of risen into this more intellectual class, which was, you know, also uh, more privileged. And, um, you know, then you kind of have the prospect of, you know, if you can make it, you can, uh, they might let you travel and you'll have these other privileges. And uh, so he has this very, I mean, that was one thing, that's one thing that really kind of plagues him in this book that he feels yes. guilty about is that he, he uh, has risen above this working class background. Right, that kind of comes late in the book, this antagonism between his desire to write poetry and his like long days at the factory. And there's this scene that I really loved where he describes working with this older man who um, it says that uh, um, when they eat lunch, the guy is eating salami sandwiches whose soft pale bread slices show his black fingerprints, a mixture of lubricant and gray iron dust. C watched the man eat his sandwiches with relish, regardless of the fingerprints, and thought, couldn't he at least eat darker bread? A short time passed, and C was eating sandwiches with black lube spots, too. And that comes very late in the book when he's already this sophisticated man with the buttery leather jacket who's had this life uh, in Nuremberg and um, Munich. Um, and yet he's somehow back in the factory, like you were saying, there's this sort of um, these, it's these convolutions of time and place, but they don't feel egregious to me. I, I didn't get annoyed with them while reading the book. Rather, I respected the that the linkages were swift. Like in his mind, he might elide um, the spark gap between two different forms of memory. But what, like as a reader, he's creating this sense, like those fingerprints on that bread, it, it's like a beer glass that is clouded with grease and dirt and exhalation and that's his mind. And he's very gifted and attuned to the, the look of dirt and grease and also the smells and feel like he's a kind of, he's a genius of textures, I think, and sensations sort of in that way, he kind of reminds me of George Orwell, who was always very attuned to his own misery and what everything feels like and smells like. I mean, stylistically, they're completely different, but it's rare to find a writer who is that much of a kind of phantasmagorical sensualist of his own wretched uh, being. Well, I think that, I think it does go back to his being a real working class writer, just not in the, you know, officially sanctioned way, but I think he really, he is writing about this, this, uh, reality, this very physical reality of this, you know, being very aware of your body and you're, you're sweating and you stink and, you know, you've got this dust under your fingernails that you can never get off and, and, uh, and you're surrounded by, uh, you know, machinery and all kinds of weird substances and this kind of probably half falling apart factory. Uh, it's, I mean, I think that's where this, this kind of sensuality and physicality comes from and it's very it's very gritty it's kind of uh it's some you know it's somewhere between beauty and, and ugliness and it's kind of hard to say which is which but i think he feels in a weird way very at home there in this in this very physical environment and uh and then when he's in west germany i think he feels kind of you know everything is more pleasant and everything's much nicer and uh, and, and more colorful and so forth, but there's something kind of immaterial about it. It's very virtual. It's, uh, and that's, I think this, this pornography that he's always watching, it kind of stands for that in a way. It's these kind of these, these sort of airbrushed images that are ostensibly of human beings, uh, 
but they're actually very kind of, they're more like simulacra that he can't, uh, you know, that, that aren't actually, that can't be touched and that don't give any kind of human contact. Whereas this kind of work, this sort of nightmarish uh, factory environment right. uh, actually has something kind of uh, at least genuine to it. Sure. Well, the women are under glass and behind glass and they proffer their wares, but then the curtain comes down at the very last yeah. moment before you can really get a glance, a glimpse. Um, is there like an estate of Wolfgang Hilbig? Like, are there people whose approval you need to seek out to publish this work? Or are there people who in Germany who were friends of his or are scholars of his work? Like, do you have a sort of relationship to people who kind of sign off on what you do or look at it or offer thoughts or how does that work? Yes, well, his publisher uh, has the rights to his work and they've been doing really, I mean, they're now doing his kind of his complete works in a very nice edition and- Who's his uh, publisher? Fischer Verlag. Okay. Yeah, and so I've been in touch with his with his former editor, who's still an editor there, and and he's helped me with some translation problems. And then I've um, I got put in touch with some friends of his, uh, actually from the small town where he where he grew up. Um, oh wow! With some of the, uh, and and then that's always a real trip. <laughs> you know, they've uh, this one friend of his showed me around the that you know the town and all the places that he describes and and was able to help me with a lot of some more personal questions. And then uh, then one of his ex-partners is actually, she translates herself from, from, the, uh, from the English. And I think she might be kind of the, she might be sort of the model for Mona in, the, in this book, but I've, I didn't ask her about anything about this book because it seemed a little bit too, <laughs> maybe too intimate, but I've asked her. Yeah questions about other works of his and she's been very, very helpful. So there, there is a kind of a very, uh, there are definitely people in Germany who are keeping his work alive and there's kind of, there's a, a circle of, there's a little literary society that's been doing a lot of events uh, in this year because it's his, it would have been his 80th birthday. So um, there's been kind of more attention around this work now and uh, um, we have some questions in the Q and A, so maybe I should, since it's now ten to three, save time for those. Okay, um, Jeffrey Zuckerman, oh, I believe himself is a translator. Um, for Isabel, it's so clear how deeply Hilbig's life and surroundings informed his books. What gaps did his death and that of the DDR, DDR? create for you as a translator and what sort of research and other experience was involved to fully translate the world of Hilbig's words? I think I just kind of spoke to some of that now. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's, it's really, it is very sad that he, I, I think I started trying to, yeah, I, I started trying to find a, an English language publisher for his work in, in the year 2000, basically. So, um, and I didn't find a publisher until 2010. So um, there was a space where I was kind of occasionally, I, I went to some of his readings and I did chat to him and I said, I'm trying to find, you know, I'm trying to publish some of your shorter work or whatever in translation. And one time, you know, I, he helped me with a translation question. I wrote him a letter and he wrote me a letter back, uh, but I didn't really have that much. Um, I. Yeah, I, I spoke to him a couple times, but he was always kind of someone, yeah, he just seemed like, I mean, he was very nice, but he just, he seemed like he was kind of in his own world and he was a little bit unapproachable. So, uh, and unfortunately, yeah, he, he died before I was uh, doing any of the longer translations. So I was, um, yeah, I was, I've been getting help from his friends and from, um, yeah, from his former editor and, um, but I, I kind of think, I, I wonder if he would have been up to, uh, I, I'm not sure that he was the kind of writer who would necessarily sit down with their translator and go through all your translation questions and kind of come up with, you know, uh, sort of a rational answer for his word choice here and there. Cause I think he wrote very, you know, very, very intuitively. Um, so yeah, but it was certainly unfortunate that he wasn't able to, to see the, 
the works, uh, the translations be published. I mean, tonally, you really do seem to sustain something that feels like, um, it, you know, it has a, a sheen to it. Like I was trying to describe, there's this phrase that Richard Howard always used, but maybe just to, to Jeffrey Zuckerman's question, I wonder, um, like, in, in terms of the time period, historically, I'm assuming you had to do some research to just investigate kind of realms that he's describing so that you can see them for yourself because they no longer exist. Well, a lot of it still, I mean, when I moved to Germany in the 90s, a lot of things still, you know, looked as they did, looked as they had in the late years of the GDR. So I, I did have a sense of the atmosphere um, and, you know, some of the places that he's described, um, you know, hadn't actually changed that much. And there is a, a fair number of historical background that's quite specific that, you know, I would have to research or ask my, you know, my other East German friends about. And the train stations you're naturally familiar with, I would imagine. Yeah, I had to, there were a couple I had to Google and try to find pictures of them because like these border stations that I'm not familiar with and probably look totally different now because they're no longer, you know, border checkpoints. Right. Um, stuff like that. Um, okay, there's another question from Marcus Hoffman. Hildbig's writing is very peculiar and often strange in a compelling way. Which of the books of his you have so far translated would you recommend as a gateway into his work? Oh, it's, it's hard to say. It depends what, what your taste is. Uh, if you're looking for uh, more of a, a novel, kind of a classical novel, which would be more like the, the interim or I, um, or if you are looking for very condensed lyrical language, I mean, his, his novellas are quite a different style because they're very, they're quite surreal and the language is very, uh, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like a 30 page long prose poem in a sense. So if you're really looking for this very intense, uh, concentrated language, then the novellas or the, the short stories might be a good place to start. I mean, the short stories are probably, you know, short stories are always good for, um, so The Sleep of the Righteous is the collection of the stories that I've done so far. And that's always a good gate, gateway drug, I think. And what's your favorite of his novellas? Because I was actually curious to ask you that myself. Um, I guess I'd have to say the old rendering plant because it's just so, yeah, it's, it's just so perfect. And the, the ending is just, um, yeah, it's really like nothing, <laughs> nothing else I've ever read. The description of it sounded extremely visceral. <laughs> y yes, literally. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, anonymous. A translation question. The book is disorienting at times, moving somewhat abruptly through time and space as sea spirals deeper and deeper into drink and despair. How did you as a translator navigate that confusion? And I know you'd mentioned that. Um, how did you achieve the excellent balance between the clarity of your translation with the disorientation inherent in the text itself? Well, it was really, I mean, the, the temporal shifts were one of the main problems in the translation because you have to, you know, I have to kind of figure out, do I now use, do I have to use the simple past now or the, you know, the flu perfect, like how many layers of past, is this a flashback within a flashback or is there another flashback on top of it? Uh, so that was, that was a problem um, that I, I'd often have to ask German friends and, you know, it's, I think in the end, probably he didn't even know where some of the, you know, what the time frame was of some of the some of the passages, uh, but I I did try to find uh, you know often sort of more intuitively make the uh, yeah make the shifts somehow logical at least on kind of a dream a level of dream logic or something. But his editor must have been helpful with that kind of thing, no? His German. Oh, um, I he he was as helpful as as. Uh, as he could be, but I think often it is, I think sometimes these, these shifts in time, you know, it is, it is uh, intentional that often you're not sure where you are and different kind of planes of time will sort of overlap each other. So it's, 
or, you know, it's just kind of like this endless loop. And so it would be kind of, it's not like you can kind of figure out this whole structure of nested flashbacks or whatever, and then you kind of figure it out in the end and you know exactly where you are. It's more uh, that these, these time frames are actually kind of melting into each other. Right. I found it not really to be bothersome. I mean, but that maybe it's, it's suited to my own psychology, which is that I'm endlessly berating myself for being a somewhat lazy reader. So if I found that I was disoriented, I was sure that it was my own fault for not paying close enough attention. And then I would start to pay closer and closer attention. And then I could see up close that in fact, there was a haze that was in the text itself. And I was sure that, um, that it wasn't by mistake. Yeah, that's definitely the case. Yeah. Well, um, it's been an hour, so maybe, and I've, you've answered all the questions. Maybe we should close unless there's something that I didn't, that I neglected to ask you about that you feel is important to mention. Oh, I think you, yeah, you asked some really wonderful questions and I can't think of anything to add necessarily. I love this book. I only have the advanced, um, copy, um, hint, hint, maybe they'll send me the hardcover, but, um, I really encourage people who haven't to read it. It is a trip. He is really funny and, um, I don't know, very inspiring. It's like, it really is like nothing else, um, that I have read. Um, and as a fiction writer, I think that it raises really interesting questions about autobiography. And like with this book, I think it actually does matter that it's very palpable to the reader that this person is speaking from firsthand um, experience. Yeah. It's just not the kind of stuff you could make up. So it's causing me to really think about what novels are and how they're built. And also finally, why people write them. Um, thank you so much for your beautiful work uh, on this book mm -hmm. and bringing, rendering this incredible writer in English um, that I would have, I would have no access to um, without, without that work that you've done. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you both. It really is a wonderful translation. And Rachel, thank you for this conversation for hosting tonight. Um, I do have one brief question for you both, which is, will we survive this century? What do you think? <laughs> Well, he was talking about the last century and he was right. <laughs> Surely we did. Yeah. We did survive that one last century. I guess we'll have to see about, about the 21st. Um, for those of you at home. What does it mean to survive? I definitely won't be around at the end of this century. So enjoy every moment as much as you can. <laughs> That's the spirit. It's very optimistic. Um, Thank you both for joining us again. Those of you at home, uh, please do consider purchasing a copy of the interim while we still have these cool tote bags. Uh, we will send you one if you mention the event in your order, order uh, comments on the website. So, you know, to be a capitalist chill, buy the book. Um, thank you so much once again and have a great night, everyone. Thank you, Noah. Yeah, support independent bookstores and independent presses. Take care. Bye.